Hey everyone, it's Pacific, and welcome back to another episode of Out of Place. I have a bit of a favor to ask you this week. If you're enjoying the show and you like Season 2, I highly encourage you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or share the show and tell a friend. Word of mouth and Apple Podcast reviews are the two best ways to help our show grow, and it would mean the world to us. With that said, and without further ado, this week's episode. The office had a barbecue yesterday evening. I think it's part of a concerted effort to make our work seem normal. Pretending we're just another bunch of white-collar drones is supposed to be a counterpoint to the fact we deal with so many impossible, mind-bending concepts every day. It's easy to be cynical about it, but at least someone's putting thought into keeping us sane. Depending on which state they're from, Americans care a lot about barbecues. I'm used to a tin tray of charcoal and some underdone chicken legs. Over here it's a mountain of pulled pork, slabs of ribs, marinades and dry rubs and enormous mountains of meat. I rather got into it. Rico from Logistics insisted that Santa Maria is the only way to cook meat and heaped piquinto beans onto my plate. I was tempted to down one of the bottles of Corona beer he'd brought, but I've sworn off the stuff since college and managed to resist. I'm still at a remove from the rest of the people here. And maybe they all feel that way. It's difficult to feel a real connection with someone when you've seen the things we have. What do work buddies and bowling trips mean when we know so acutely the world could end at any moment for a reason no one ever anticipated? Or perhaps they're all best friends and whisper amongst themselves about the weird Brit who analyzes the mission data. I should put more effort in, I know, but with the work, there's not much room for anything else in my head. It's not really the destruction of the planet that's a big worry for the project. If that happens, it happens. There isn't much anyone can do about a comet smacking into us or the sun blowing up. It's what happens to society that concerns them. A community. If that falls apart, we might as well all be dead. Humans aren't supposed to exist outside a community. It's something to do with our heads being too big to be born when we're properly mature, so there has to be a tribal group to look after the babies. We're evolved to be social. When society falls apart, we can't function as a species. Alone, we start dying off. I've been thinking about that a great deal. When the last lot of mission data came in, it was almost a relief. The orbital data was from a timeline that showed massive scale destruction, not clustered around population centers as with a nuclear exchange or radiating out from a central impact like an asteroid strike. Instead, it was scattered across the globe, leaving it pocked and cratered like the back wall of a shooting range. In places, the coastlines were impossible to discern, with the ground chewed up and the sea flowing into the wounds. The southern half of Africa was unrecognizable. A new ocean had flowed into a scar running from the Caspian Sea to the Arctic Circle. A new continent of upwelled magma formed a basalt scab in the middle of the Pacific. I ran the visible impact sites through a pattern recognition program, and they look like a random distribution. There's no mystery about how mankind died out this time. It wasn't a social collapse or any plague. Big rocks fell from the sky, kicked off massive seismic events and choked up the atmosphere. The people who survived the impacts and the firestorms suffocated from the altered air or froze when the dust blocked out the sun. What's more interesting is what the dead population left behind. Where buildings were not leveled, enormous structures survived. Some were massive complexes of concrete bunkers several kilometers across. 
Others were towers, with a few remaining standing being between two and three kilometers high. Not just a couple either. The surface of the planet had been covered with them. Fallen towers were easily visible to the orbital probes in numbers that suggested there had been hundreds of them before the catastrophe. Sometimes, history takes a very different turn, creating a present totally alien to our own which just so happens to be wiped out by a collision with an astronomical object. It was entirely possible this timeline represented such a fate. However, the combination of such widespread anomalous structures and the unusual pattern of destruction was enough to merit a visit from the Extend team to find out what had happened. The team had to bring extra protective gear with them given the atmosphere wasn't likely to be breathable. That meant loading down the capsule with air tanks, masks and MBC suits. They were limited to sidearms only, which never fails to get some grumbles. Their target location was in what used to be the Guizhou province of China, near the city of Guiyang. That was the location of one of the few standing tower structures, with a bunker a few miles away. While it had avoided the worst of the destruction, multiple minor impacts had ruined parts of the city and hit the surrounding mountains and forests, so any anomalies with the impact sites could be studied as well. The landing was a rough one. The capsule was badly off course and landed in a ravine opened up by the seismic activity after a nearby impact. It fell about 150 meters and was more than half a kilometer away from the target location. Warrant Officer Poulter suffered what would prove to be a broken wrist after the briefing, and the rest suffered minor injuries. The sky was burned orange. The land was dark as if in twilight, though the sun showed overhead as a vivid yellow disk. The vegetation was dead, starved of light and air. Even as they clambered out of the ravine, the team could see the tower, a stark, pale grey shard reaching up high overhead. It had suffered some damage to the upper portion which had been broken off, exposing the metal lattice and pipework inside. Upon reaching ground level, they were also able to locate the bunker complex, which they could now see was built into the foothills of a nearby mountain. The first task was to survey the tower. Poulter sent a drone in to film the broken portion as the rest of the team looked for a way in. They located a maintenance door at the ground floor and forced it open with a crowbar. Inside was a cramped space with various valves and controls labelled in Mandarin and English, though the team could not ascertain the purpose of the tower. It wasn't a residence or an office, but housed a mass of machinery, pipework and pumps. Poulter got images of the broken portion and confirmed the tower's height at 2,500 metres. That's about three times the height of the Burj Khalifa. The team could not ascertain the purpose of the structure. Any conclusions about it were drawn later, after the team was debriefed and the intelligence they brought back examined by the project's technical analysts. That didn't stop them speculating. Poulter thought it was a transmitter tower. Private Sandish believed it was a gigantic laser for fighting the aliens he posited must have attacked Earth. Sergeant Brand has always discouraged such speculation, but admitted during debriefing that he thought it was some kind of monument. The team moved on, eager to maximize their limited mission time. On the hike towards the bunker complex, they passed more impact craters and the remains of a town completely destroyed. Poulter took samples from one of the craters and noted the high technology of the ruined town, which had charging ports on the street for electric cars and large domed structures with suggestions of extensive climate control systems. Upon reaching the bunker complex, the team confirmed its immense size and the fact it seemed to continue far into the mountainside. Minor impacts had damaged some of the complex and the ruined wall afforded the team entrance. The dark interior was a warren of maintenance tunnels and access to enormous rooms of uncertain purpose. Though from the English labelling, it was apparent this was a form of power plant. Some chambers held gigantic tanks of coolant and others were turbine halls. After about an hour of exploration, approaching the maximum they could spend before returning to the capsule, the team reached a ring-shaped structure in a cavern within the mountainside. It was 20 metres across and 40 high, suspended by cables in the cavern with pipes and vents around it, suggesting the cavern could be filled with gas. The team observed this through windows of thickened glass in a control centre, though none of the computers in the centre were functional. 
the warrant officer Poulter took a particular interest in what they saw. I know what I saw. I'm not an expert, but I've seen the plans. No one's ever built one, not a full-size one, but that's what I saw in that mountain. It was a fusion reactor. The ring was a torus where the plasma was formed. I saw the coils for the electromagnetic fields. They, they must have used it to contain it. I guess the cavern would be filled with gas to insulate it and keep it stable. I got photographs through the windows, but there wasn't a way in to send a drone to find more angles. If we had, I don't know, a week in there, we could get enough data to recreate it. Work out how to solve all the problems, at least. We could build a frickin' fusion generator, the holy grail, clean energy, no fossil fuels, no wars for oil. Sure, I wanted to stay, but the Sarge said the mission time was running out and we only had so much air. I would have cut it a lot finer than we did. I guess that's why he's the Sarge. He kept to the mission parameters and wasn't going to let a punk like me step outside the lines. I can't believe I saw it though. Working fusion power. It's like, like a religious person seeing the tomb of Christ. Actual proof it was real. The Sarge got us out of there. Quintero had dropped light sticks so we could find our way out. By that time, it was dark outside too. The moonlight was orange. Must have been the way the dust in the air filtered the light. It had been heavy going reaching the entrance, so we checked around the mountain slope for an easier way down, and I rounded a shoulder of the mountain to see the city, Goyang. It looked like it had been bombed to crap. Half of it looked like one of those wartime photos of Dresden or Hiroshima, but the parts that were standing, they were science fiction. Domes everywhere, towers connected by skywalks, monorails running between everything, parks and fountains. What wasn't destroyed was amazing. The fusion plant explains it. They had enough power to do whatever they wanted. Electric cars and trains, huge construction projects, those climate controlled domes. Even though it had been totally wrecked, I could see how they lived. There's nowhere like it in our world. I guess on this one, it was like that everywhere. Those huge towers were a part of it too. I, I wished even harder I knew what they were for. The Sarge said we weren't there to sightsee. I thought of saying, technically, that's exactly why we were there. But I've got chewed out enough for being a smartass that I took a couple more shots and kept quiet. We started the hike down back towards the capsule, and after half a click, Sandik says, Guys, check out the moon. Of course, I assume he's just being a dipshit like usual, but I looked up behind us and I saw where the moon had cleared the top of the mountain, and the clouds of dust had thinned out in the wind enough to see it. And goddamn if it didn't look like someone had taken a bite right out of it. Just a huge chunk gone from the side. It was yellow thanks to all the crap in the air, but it was definitely the moon. Well, what was left of it anyway. You could actually see a bit of the interior where the piece had been torn away. All those layers like when you cut through a gobstopper. The surface around the break was cracked and pieces were missing. Even the Sarge stopped and stared at it for a while. Quintero asked what had happened to it, so I told him what I was thinking. That whatever space rock had hit the Earth actually hit the moon first, broke about a billion pieces of it, and it rained down all over the planet. So it got thousands of Hiroshima's going off instead of a single impact. The clouds rolled back in again. Sarge told me to tell him I'd gotten a picture of it, and thankfully I had. It's pretty much automatic now. Whenever I see something weird, I get some shots. By that time, our air was getting low, so we made the rest of the hike down to the ravine where the capsule had ended up. It still bothers me, though. All those things together. The city, the fusion plant, and the moon. The point of diversion from our own world is cracking workable nuclear fusion. I'm sure of that. Did that timeline just happen to get hit by a space rock? That's two major diversions from our own timeline but it's a pretty close one to our own reality. Things shouldn't have played out that differently. Maybe the algorithm was out, I don't know. I just worry there's a connection we didn't see. The return was better than the journey out. The capsule was too high again, about 70 meters, but it was only seven minutes off. The team was decontaminated before debrief, which takes an hour and always makes for more grumbling. 
They couldn't eat with all the protective gear on, so the kitchen supplied them with a platoon's worth of burgers and milkshakes before they were debriefed. Poulter mentioned the target timeline was nearby. This is as good a term as any. That means it's a lot like our timeline. It should only differ by a single major event. Timelines that are further away differ by more. That's when we start getting Earths with no intelligent life or no life at all. Places the dinosaurs never died out or the fish never crawled out of the sea. Further out and there's no Earth or solar system at all. The furthest timelines differ all the way back to the Big Bang with different laws of physics. The project has some way of isolating nearby timelines even though they're not physically further away or even more difficult to get to. It's all in the mathematics and definitely not my department. Poulter was right, too. There was a connection. It took a while to work it out. It wasn't me who did it, it was one of the science guys who was looking at the fusion reactor and made the link. Fusion reactors make energy by forcing atomic nuclei to combine into one bigger nucleus. For some reason that releases lots of energy. Again, the, the science is beyond me, I mean, it's literally nuclear physics. Anyway, they need fuel, just like the fission reactors we use in this world. One potential fuel is helium-3, an isotope of helium that has two protons instead of one. Helium-3 doesn't occur in large quantities on Earth, and what we have is locked up in the mantle, too far down for mining. If we wanted anything like the quantity needed for fusion power, we'd have to go somewhere else. We'd have to go to the moon. The moon has a lot of helium-3 on it, compared to Earth at least. Even then, huge amounts of lunar material would have to be processed to get the amount we'd need. There's some on the surface, but if that wasn't enough, we'd have to start digging deeper. We don't know everything about the interior of the moon. There's no certainty what we'd find if we really started digging. And the sheer amount of materials needed to sift out the helium-3 means we'd have to dig massive, open-cast mines. It's a fun engineering problem in a sense. They'd all have to be automated, I expect, with a couple of missions or maybe a small colony to maintain them. There are probably governments right now who have plans to go up there and build it if we ever got a workable helium-3 reactor. That world was addicted to consequence-free power. Poulter had been right about that. The tower they surveyed was examined by the tech guys and they said it was a form of climate control. It created a dome-shaped layer of air with a different density to the rest of the atmosphere and let them contain and control weather systems inside it. They could tweak the climate to be as balmy and people-friendly as possible. No more droughts or floods, no storms. Perfect for agriculture or just living your life in those fully powered cities. All that took so much electricity, even the fusion reactors were hard-pressed to satisfy it. And the mines on the moon had to dig more and more. But what if they dug somewhere they shouldn't? Or too deep? Or just came across some flaw in the moon's structure nobody suspected was there? And the moon just... broke? Split along a fracture or triggered a quake strong enough to start throwing off chunks of the moon into space? A chain reaction big enough to result in the shattered moon the team saw in the sky over the devastated Earth. There's only one place all that moon rock will go. Earth's gravity would drag it all right towards us and hurl it down like thousands of meteors. The ground broke, the towers fell, the reactors shut down, the air choked up, the temperature fell, and everyone died. What is... The project's operations division is getting ready to send a lot of men and equipment somewhere. Ops is the part of the project that makes things happen. They go to timelines and grab things, change things. Even here in the office, we're pretty sure they can go back in time. I wouldn't be surprised if they were going to the timeline the Extant team just returned from to grab everything they can from that fusion reactor. Or maybe go back to before the rocks fell and get a good look at one in action. The project's perfect world needs power, and a fusion reactor would fulfill that requirement very neatly. I just hope they remember the moon over Guiyang. Broken, because even a miracle fuel has to come from somewhere. 
It turns out, I suppose, that even rocks falling from the sky isn't always just an act of random chance. Sometimes it's a failing in society that brings them down. Not a collapse or a war this time, but an addiction. I admit, I like the idea of a life under constant balmy sunshine where the necessities of life are almost free. I understand completely how the world became addicted to it. The Extant team has a talent for finding worlds where it was old-fashioned human failings that ended us all, and they just found yet another way for us to do it. I console myself by thinking however we destroy ourselves, I know better. I would never make those mistakes. But I can't kid myself this time. If I had lived in that world, I would have been as guilty as anyone of bringing down the sky. Out of Place was written and created by Ben Counter. Sound design and music was done by Dana Creesman. This show was produced by Pacific S. Obadiah. Andrew was Ben Counter. And Poulter was Russell Moore.